Welcome to the Living and Happiness Scrutiny Meeting this evening. The first order of business is the election of the Chair and the Vice Chair of the Scrutiny Commission. May I ask members to nominate the position of Chair? Shall we, Patrick? And seconder? I'll second. Thank you. Councillor Patrick, who is duly elected Chair of the Scrutiny Commission Living and Happiness, I'll now hand over to the Chair to do the election for the Vice Chair. Thank you. I second. Is there a there's the nomination for uh, the vice chair. Um, I've got the nomination of Councillor Jera. Um, I'd like to nominate Councillor Jera. Seconded. Seconded. Councillor Jera is elected as vice chair. Thank you, everybody. Um, apologies for absence. Um, no apologies have uh, been received. We are quorum. The quorum is Freeman. Um, sorry, uh, Councillor Joseph. Right. It's, it's uh, said she can't attend. Thank you. I've got apologies from Councillor Joseph. Apologies for absence, we've got Councillor Joseph. We are for it. We have one, two, three, five members actually um, physically present. And uh, Councillor Jerry and Councillor Mamon are um, online with us. Urgent items, I've got no urgent items. Declarations of interest, um, we're in declaration of interest. <coughs> oh. Right, we're moving on to item five, which is trust and confidence and inclusion, inclusive policing. Uh, we've got two hours um, for this. Um, the Living in Happy Schools Mid Commission initially commenced this work following their meeting in January 2019 when the Commission heard about the rollout of body ball cameras, working with the account group, the Safe and Neighbourhood Fold, and the programmes in school to improve. Und undertaking on both sides about stop and search, concerns about the growing distance between the community and the police. Especially chair, can I just interrupt? Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Chair. There's a lot of background noise and your voice is very echoey and I can only dial in on the telephone and I'm struggling to hear what you're saying, I'm afraid. There's children's voices in the background. It's very, very echoey. Sorry. I can't hear what you're saying, I'm sorry. That's all right. Can I ask people when they speak to say who they are? Because although you're on screen, you're... You're quite a long way away and I can't, we can't see people clearly. That was Marcus Barnett, the BCU commander. I'm on the telephone, I'm not on video. I haven't got that facility. Yes, but, um, I'm really struggling that. to hear what you're saying. Okay. Sorry. Just trying to get some technical difficulties. Right. We're talking about um, concerns about the growing distance between the community. The risk is what start uh, to look at this issue. It's concerns about the growing distance between the community and the police, especially with young people. That the commission scheduled an update meeting in June 2020. At uh, Living in Hackney meeting in November 2020, the key things that emerged to follow up were the MSPC complaints, so MSPS complaint system. The system is not trusted and seldom used by the community, most impacted on stop and search activity. Accountability of police officers for behaviour and appropriate use of police tools. The wider public perception is that the MS MPS does not have robust systems in place for police officers to be held to account. No set monitoring targets for stop and search and outcome success rate. Having an average of 20 to 25% success rate from the volume of stop and searches conducted, we felt was not a good demonstration of success or a good use of resources. Reducing the disproportionality amongst ethnic minority groups being stopped and searched. There is no reports of current work to address this or reassurance given on how the MPS plan to address this wider than the BCU review work. 
representation of Hackney's diverse community in MPS and MOPAC, community engagement and scrutiny structures. We learned that the NPS are working to improve dialogue and engagement with the public, but this is not widely known by the community. This meeting will be a discussion with the Metropolitan Police Service, uh, Headquarters, Borough Commander for Hackney, the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime, the Independent Police Conduct Authority, um, about building trust and confidence and inclusion, <coughs> inclusive policing. Questions were sent out to the IOPC, NPS and MOPAC for a response in advance of this meeting. We are pleased that all our invited press have agreed to attend and participate in this discussion. We appreciate your attendance. Discussion will be in three sections. Section one, the IOPC, questions and answers. Question two, MOPAC, verbal response to questions and questions and answers. There's going to be a short five minutes break and then we'll question three, which is Metropolitan Police questions and answers. Other guests not speaking who are in attendance are perhaps Susan for Dunn. I can't hear what you're saying, Chair. I'm really sorry. It's dreadful. The line is absolutely awful. I'm oh. really sorry. Very, very echoey. You want to plug in headphones? The other people in attendance are Councillor Fajanda Thomas, Cabinet Member for Community Safety, Morris Mason, Community Safety Partnership Manager, Jerry McCartney, Head of Community Safety Enforcement and Fitness Regulation, Jason Davis, Strategic Leads Policy Officer for Hackney Community Safety Partnership, uh, Louise Burwood from the SMB Chair, and Nicola Babineau from the Safer Neighbours Board. I may invite these guests to respond to any points made or answer questions in responses made in the meeting. Section one is the IOPC. We've got 35 minutes for this item. All the questions were submitted in advance uh, and were published on the agenda under item five. The discussion will cover the Independent Office of Police Conduct, MSP Complaints, Culture Change and Youth Engagement. Can I just go straight to So I'd like to welcome uh, the Independent Office of, Office of Police Conduct, the IOPC, Sam McNeeson. And then also should, should be Emma Pierce and Usman Bad. Good evening, Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, Sal Nassim, I'm Regional Director for London at the IOPC. Uh, we've got my colleague Emma Pierce from the IOPC in attendance as well. Uh, I will apologise, I might ask you to repeat a few things. The call quality isn't great, so um, please bear with me. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, that uh, the Commission has or anybody in attendance has tonight. Okay. You want to go straight into Kuna? Yeah, all right. Hello and welcome um, to the meeting. So we've got two screens and various computers and bits of paper, so you'll have to forgive us if we're not always looking at you. Um, oh, can I just come in? Marcus uh, can't hear. Could I suggest that if Marcus, if you can hear, could you log on to YouTube live stream and at least you'll be able to hear and then stay on the phone at the same time? I'll try that, Morris. I think you said log on to YouTube and speak through that. No, not. No, you can't speak through that, unfortunately, Marcus. You just stay on your phone but log on to YouTube as well. I'll text you. Yeah, all right, thank you. Brilliant idea. I've never never known anyone not be able to hear me before. This is not going to I can't hear people, but they can normally hear me. 
Thank you. We've lost the sound there. No, no I'm, I'm here, it's not you. Is the is the is the is the audio Sharon? Not about you. Sorry, that's the Thomas. I said it's not it's not your voice. It's because of the audio in general. There's yeah. this it's very bad very bad, bad quality. Yeah, it's very bad. I am sorry. We are, we we are trying uh, to do a twenty first century meeting with twenty twenty century technology. Okay. okay. Chair, can I just confirm? I am here, so yes, uh, I will try to answer the question. <laughs> there you are. Your can we can you. see you. Yeah. Uh, let's have a start off with the first question, uh, which is: uh, Can you ask me, ask me why? Why is the reason such a large proportion of complaints or appeals uh, are not upheld by the IOPC? So. I just want to check my understanding of the question. So you're asking a question about the number of appeals upheld by us, is that right? Yeah, why, why the number of appeals and reviews, why such a small amount or such a large proportion of complaints or appeals are not upheld? Well, the figures that we sent across to you were from 1st of Feb 2020 to 10th of May 2021. Um, and just for the benefit of um, the group, um, in the response that we sent, 32% um, of appeals that were sent to us concerning the Met, we upheld. Now, that figure is actually an improvement from where the Met have been historically. And to give you an idea, we did um, check this. And back in 2013, 2014, we were upholding over half Oh, could, I, could I request if I'm speaking for others to go on mute? Maybe that will help. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Right. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll try again. So as I was saying, historically, uh, back in 2013-2014, over 50% of appeals that came through to us, we upheld. Now, over the years, the Met have improved and the, uh, the figure has gradually come down. And the figure that we've provided you in the pack that we sent through of 32% appeals being upheld is the best that the Met have actually performed. So I think there needs to be some recognition for that. Um, but obviously, I appreciate when you, when you look at that 32% of appeals, so that's a third of all appeals to us being held, it, it doesn't look great, but that is actually an improved picture from where it has been in the past. Okay. So you're saying the opposite to the way we were thinking, that you're, up, you're upholding less appeals and um, reviews because the Met have improved and the appeals or reviews are not work, or you haven't upheld them because you don't, the, the police, haven't Mr. Hans, suppose is one might put the, the, the police haven't done anything wrong. Is that what you're saying? That their behaviour has improved. So what we're finding is in two thirds of the complaints, the complaint appeals that we see, um, mm. we are finding um we're finding in favour of the police. But in a third of the complaints appeals mm. that we do see, the reviews that we get now we're actually um, upholding in favour of the complainants. In the past, now that figure was half. Half of complaints that we've seen in the past, we were upholding. So uh, what I'm saying is it's an improving picture. Right. Okay, thank you. Sorry, sorry may, may I come in here, please? Um, it's Emma Pierce from the, the IOPC. I'm, I'm the oversight liaison for the Met. I think the figures that we've sent across and um, the figures that Sal just spoke to, 32%, when, when the IOPC considers an appeal, there's numerous grounds that we can uphold the appeal on. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean something, uh, an officer was at fault. There may be a not enough information provided to the complainant. We disagreed with the findings, but ultimately the outcome was the same. 
or we've actually asked for a reinvestigation. So some of those upheld figures can mean slightly different things, if that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, Chair, can I also come in, please? It's the BCU commander. Yes. I think we all, the other important point, which I'm sure colleagues from the IOPC will come on to, is, um, you know, very helpful. You said, obviously, it's an improving picture. And um, I'd like to think that's a result of the significant hard work that the Met are doing. But I think it's probably also fair to say, I would imagine, that 32% are upheld, 68% not upheld. And there's probably a big element of that that says the police officers were found to have done nothing wrong. Mm, yes. Yes. Well, we assume that's why they've been up here. Um, to the IOP, um, what learning or areas of improvement do you take away from the cases uh, that are upheld? Upheld, and uh, how do you how do you pass that learning on? So you're talking about individual. Um, decisions there chair and um at this stage we don't have that information for um the figures quoted and sent through to you i, I would just point that every year we do produce um annual um police complaint statistics and it's an annual report that's published in that report there is a breakdown of the types of things we're seeing not just for the met but across the 43 police forces in england and wales um, the areas um, that complaints are being upheld on or not being upheld on, the, the types of complaints that we're seeing, the breakdown by ethnicity. Uh, unfortunately, um, we don't have that information to hand for this financial year. That will be published next year. But that information is in the public uh, domain and that is something we can send through to you. Now, coming back to that point on learning. Now, We've got legal powers to make uh, learning recommendations to help improve policing practice. Now, just as we can do with independent investigations, as you quite rightly pointed out, we can also do that for um, appeals and appeals that you know our casework um, colleagues see. Uh, that can be on an individual basis, and I've seen some of that work being taken forward. It very much depends on the circumstances of that of that individual matter. So um, I don't have any of those um, figures to hand, but just to give you some sense of the amount of work that goes on in this space, since we were created in 2018, there's been over 400 uh, learning recommendations made. So each one, an individual opportunity to improve policing practice in a particular area. Thank okay. you. Uh, is it possible for the IOC to have a role in helping establish the standards for accountability of the police to reassure the public there is a robust system and processes in place to root out inappropriate behaviour and manage unconscious bias and address poor standards of the police and officers' conduct? Can I just check the, the question, Chair? Are you saying is there a role for us to set the standards? Is that right? Um, to help establish the standards, yes. yes. Establish, right. So our, our role in the system is to help ensure police are held accountable for their actions and that lessons are learned, and also to ensure um, guardianship of the police complaint system. All that means that we're there to help ensure that the public have confidence in their police service. Now, in terms of establishing the standards, I think it's right to point out that there are national standards in place that all police officers have to abide by. And here too, uh, Marcus will know that much better than, than myself. Um, so there are there's a code of ethics that all police officers have to adhere to. Uh, there's also professional standards and when we investigate matters, you know, as well as making sure that the officers have adhered to the relevant standard operating procedures and the 
policies, we do go back to those core things, which are the code of ethics and those professional standards embedded in them. So what I would say is not for us to establish the standards, but it's for us to ensure that those code of ethics and professional standards that are in place already, that we make sure that they're adhered to. I suppose what I'm, I can understand that's what your role is. Because, I mean, as you know, it's, we're having this meeting because of lack of trust and confidence um, in the police by the local community. And I wondered what um, IOP, IOPC could do to take forward um, establishing trust and confidence. Um, in the place and your role as the independent regulator um, um, and also in yourselves to some extent because um, we've been told by uh, people who've been evidence here that people don't go to the IOPC, some people don't go to the IOPC because uh, one they don't think you're um, independent enough um, and two that they don't, they don't see the um, the work that you do is um, representing them, or I've looked at your website and found some of the uh, cases that you've reported on the website very interesting and the recommendations that you've made uh, about uh, the way the police work uh, I thought were very helpful. And I just want, uh, we know that the trust and confidence issue isn't only in fact, I mean, it's, um, that it's probably across London and probably across, probably across uh, I just wondered what commitment or what help you could give um, to um, helping the public understand as the IOPC um, and uh, the police complaints um, procedure um, and uh, how we could build trust and com how you and the police work together and the mayor's office. Chair, you're going to have to forgive me. I'm going to check my understanding of, of the question. Are you asking me um, what, is the, what is the role of the IOPC to help to improve that trust and confidence gap between the public and the police service? Is that a fair summation? Yeah, I'm the IOPC itself. Yeah. Yeah, okay, and the IOPC, okay. right. I think what, what I would say to that is um, we, we recognise the challenge. We recognise the challenge on both fronts in terms of building trust and confidence um, in ourselves as, as an organization because I understand there's some legacy issues from our predecessor which is so let me let me bring it back to ourselves first the IOPC um, we've got we a couple of years ago we um, recruited a dedicated stakeholder engagement team because we felt it was really important to go out to community, the communities um, we are there to um, work with and engage with them, listen to what they have to say, but really importantly, build awareness of ourselves and of the police complaint system. Now, that's why I, you know, as an organisation, you know, attended the Scrutiny Commission last year, and we're here again today. This is, this is these are things that we haven't done in the past. Over the last year, you know, we attended over 50 plus meetings uh, across London, trying to engage different groups, not just um, bodies like this, but young people, uh, charities, youth groups, um, all with the intention of building awareness of ourselves. And it's by those conversations you establish relationships. And through those relationships, you can try to close the gap which exists in trust and confidence. Now that is not a quick time fix. You know, people and people with people, communities, everybody will judge you, not on what you say, but it's on what you do. So 
quite rightly, we'll be held accountable in terms of the work that we do and the actions that we take, which is why it was really important for us to come last year and speak about the work that we had done on Stop and Search. So for us, this is how we will work and how we will continue to work nationally. And our commitment is that we will continue to work like this in London. Now, coming back to the second part of your question, which was around the police. Now, for us, we, we, we recognise that there's that gap in trust and confidence. You know, that's been well spoken about uh, nationally, but also you know, in a regional context. For us, it's really important to highlight um, that there is an accountability system in place, and we are part of that to explain our role in the process and that there's a system in place that if people are unhappy, that they can do something about it. They can voice their concerns through the police complaint system because, it, because it's their police service. It's the Metropolitan Police Service. And like any service, it can only improve if they understand when things have gone wrong and have the opportunity to put things wrong. So it's important to build awareness of the system, but it's also important to work together with the other bodies that are there. So myself, my colleagues in Mopac and my counterparts at the Met, you know, we do things jointly in terms of presenting to communities and we have done things jointly to explain our different roles in the system. Because when it comes to us, we, we, we deal with the most serious things. You know, my colleagues in Mopac will um, speak about later and they will explain their role in the system. And um, the vast majority of complaints will go to um, the Met Police to deal with initially. But it's really important for us to work together to explain what the system looks like and the fact that there is an independent body in place to look at things when they go wrong. Not There's a lot of misconception, there's a lot of confusion about our role. You know, we're not the police, we're not part of government, we're an independent body, um, but it's, it's a role it's a responsibility on us and myself as regional director for London to make sure we do kind of um, do that myth busting. We do unpick some of those misconceptions and try and close that gap which exists in trust and confidence because when that gap is too big, it doesn't benefit anybody. It might be worth, I had a look at your website, um, it was a bit uh, hazy about the what the difference between the appeals which you don't do the world and now the review. Uh, I don't think many people know uh, about how that they can go to you for a review. And it may be worth your organisation doing some publicity around that. I've very much taken on board what you said about um, trust and confidence and working with the public and going to and your community engagement and it'd be really good if uh, perhaps you could work with PACI officers um, and we could um, and perhaps the mayor's office, and the mayor's office to uh, reach local residents um, so that they know about your organisation and, and mobile and what you do because I think you're right I think a lot of people don't know what you do I think they do think some people probably do think you are the place well, I'm the place at least. Um, I don't know how to, about the amount of procedure, I think it's a waste of time. The, uh, not only for your organisations, but lots of people get put to complex procedures a waste of time because, uh, you know, no one's going to admit they're wrong. Um, I, think, I think that's across uh, very many organisations that people don't complain or they can't bother to complain because it takes a lot of energy. So it'd be really good if perhaps yourselves and Mobac would uh, work with the uh, happy officers to uh, try and get some more information out there to the public bit through the stakeholders or through uh, some sort of public meetings or things. I just wonder whether any other members have got any questions after that. <laughs> yeah, I've got a few questions. Um, hope you can hear me. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, hope it works. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Good. Okay. Um, first of all, the first question really was about those um, the reduction in upheld. So it's a bit difficult to know how to describe this. So 32% versus the 68%. Um, are, of, of those complainants, is there any kind of ethnic breakdown um, on the numbers that were upheld and not? Um, can you tell us anything about the ethnic the ethnic profile of the people who have had their appeals upheld or not? Um, against the Met Police. Um, before we sent this uh, across to yourselves, that was something we did look to see. Could we break this down any further? So there was some additional detail. But unfortunately, we don't have that at this stage. So I don't have that. Um, I don't have that clarity for you. Okay. I mean, I have to say, I think that import that's quite important because if we look uh, again at where we started on all of this, which is around stop and search and the disproportionality that there is between different ethnic groups. I think having the ethnic breakdown in those figures is actually quite crucial um, and it would be really useful for us to see that. Um, I just wonder if it concerns you in any way that given that there is a, a sort of a lack of trust to some extent with the IOPC, with, with people who do have grievances against uh, the police and the way that they've been treated. Um, sorry, my phone, i just stop it. Um, if, if, if it concerns you at all, you're in a sort of catch-22 position in a way, because what you described with the 32% is that actually you're upholding fewer complaints against the Met, um, but as you, in, as you do uphold fewer complaints against the Met, that's unlikely to inspire confidence with the public who are still feeling that, uh, you know, the Met isn't doing such a great job. How, how do you kind of square that circle? I don't, I suppose I don't necessarily take the same view in terms of, of, of the complaints being the only metric which we can be measured on. Uh, by way of success, uh, you know, I, I would look at it slightly more broadly or on a broader basis, Councillor. Um, as I said, you know, with, with the appeals and the work that, you know, our oversight team do with the Met, it's an improving picture. So um, I've, I've spoken about that. But in terms of the kind of confidence in us as an organisation, it's, it's about um, taking the opportunities to build awareness of, of the work we do to close the gaps, particularly around learning. So we, there's, there's obviously, we, we have quite a lot of facets to our work. We do our independent investigations and there, there there's the accountability piece, which is really important and they attract um, a lot of publicity. The learning side is looking at the systemic bit to prevent these issues from happening again. And if I go back to um, last year when I spoke to you all and we were looking at the work done on stop and search and the 11 learning recommendations, there is, is a really good opportunity um, to improve awareness in us and the trust and confidence in us as an organisation to show that we will focus on the areas of concern for communities in London and we will do something about it. And we've, we've done that in terms of the, the levers that we hold. Uh, the, the Met um, have accepted all 11. Um, and now we're into the phase, and you know, I'm sure you will come onto this with my colleagues in Mopac at the Met, about implementation. So confidence in us, I think, is to be measured um, more broadly than just that one kind of um, metric. I think you need to look at it, what we're trying to do and a really difficult space um, looking at um, really difficult issues and how we can move the needle in these areas by working together. Okay, so, so what you're saying is that you've got your sort of individual role of looking at individual cases and complaints and where things have gone wrong, uh, but you've also got a, a sort of a systemic um, role as well. Um, I think trust and confidence is really important, and I think the, the role that you have is really important too. Um, but 
we've just come out this week of um, a huge public inquiry which had a finding of um, institutional corruption within the Met. And what it meant by institutional corruption was not that the Met was systemically uh, working with gangsters and, and, and criminals, but rather that the Met wasn't very good at examining itself and being as transparent and candid as it should be with itself and the people that it deals with. And I guess my question to you is, Surely it was, if you are looking at the police in a systemic way, surely it was your organization's role to find that out rather than a, a long-standing public inquiry. And um, what lessons are you taking from that public inquiry and, and your role in terms of getting the Met to be more candid and to view itself and its own procedures more critically? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think there's a few points there. Um, if I come back to our role, I think I would, um, I would clarify what our role is. The inquiry had a very specific role and it, and it ran for a long time. Our role is, is set out in, in law and we will look at referrals which will come in from individual police forces mm -hmm. set out and so the law that we work under so these will be deaths or serious contacts sorry deaths or serious injuries following police contact serious conduct matters and serious types of complaints so they're individual matters which will be submitted from the 43 police forces across england and wales um and we will consider them and we will take some of these on as independent investigations. The rest will go back to, a to those police forces for them to consider. We also, as has been said, look at appeals against complaints made. Um, the inquiry has a very different remit, so I think it's important not to uh, conflate our role with what the inquiry had. Now, what, what I've said about systemic learning and in the context of the Met, what I'm saying is we will look at our independent investigations and for instance as we did the stop and search and when we look at things together and join the dots if we find that there are gaps in or shortfalls in policing procedures or policies we will make learning recommendations to close those gaps but coming to the point you're, you're making counsellor which is about Daniel Morgan report and the finding there we do have a role to play here and we we've, we've said as much publicly now the report has been published now it will be for the metropolitan police it will be for mopac and it will be for hampshire police to review the report and see whether or not any there's any referrals that need to be made to our office we've already publicly said that we will in parallel be reviewing that report we will also be considering whether there are any conduct matters arising out of the report that the panel have published and um, if necessary we can call those matters in but initially it will be the individual police forces and mopac will be considering that so we do have a role to play here but it's probably slightly different from the one posed in the question um, can I just have a quick follow-up question? I mean, are you at all concerned that the findings of that report do reflect badly on you? Is it going to make your job more difficult in terms of, you know, winning the trust and confidence that you want to win? Um, um, can I, sorry, can I just um, check the question? Um, so did you say, am I concerned that the report reflects badly on the IOPC? Yeah, I just wonder if you feel that, you know, that that finding of um, institutional corruption, which is obviously the big headline from the whole thing, um, if you think it, it reflects badly on you because of the fact that it's, that, that it's not something that's been raised by yourselves in the past. Um, and, you know, since you are partly the watchdog for the police and the, and the public safeguard of police behaviour um, and probity, um, the fact that 
this has come up in the way that it has, um, if, it, if it causes you any concern about the way that people view your organization? No, I'm sorry, I'd have to disagree. There's, there's no criticism leveled at the IOPC uh, in that report. Um, I think there is criticism, obviously, of the Metropolitan Police, which is very strongly made. But as I've explained, um, there is a process underway at the moment uh, for those police forces and for MOPAC to consider whether there's any referrals coming through to our office on that basis. And we're doing the work that I stated, but I don't agree that that report necessarily reflects badly uh, on ourselves. In terms of that term watchdog, um, it's it, it can be a tricky term because I think the term watchdog can also be used for other bodies that operate in the system. We've also got the inspectorate, HMIC, FRS, and um, I, I'm aware that they've been commissioned by the Home Secretary to do a review into the Metropolitan Police off the back of the report as well. So that there is another body, that the inspectorate, that is operating um, off the back of the, the Daniel Morgan. Uh, they'll be performing their review. We've got our role to continue here as well. Thank you. Councillor Jara. Thank you. Um, Councillor Trax already covered elements of what I wanted to raise. Um, essentially, it, it relates to learning and transparency and accountability. I think for many communities, there is a lack of trust in any complaints um, commission. Although you're the latest manifest manifestation of, of this body as such, I mean, from Cynthia Jarrett through to um, Mark Duggan and more recently in our own borough, Rashan Charles, there are many people who feel, feel let down by the processes which you implement. Um, so I think for me, it's trying to kind of understand or have some kind of reassurance in terms of what you take forward is reflective of community need. Um, I, I think particularly in respect of stop and search, I don't know what the data you have on that is at the moment in terms of the numbers of complaints, but I'm imagining they would have in all likelihood risen over recent years. But again, within that, I'm, I'm assuming that the processes you have in place will not necessarily address people's complaints in full because it'd be considered part of normal policing, whereas for the people who experience these circumstances, it's far from it. Um, so in terms of what you learn and how you, the recommendations you make and how these filter down, people would really like to see them implemented in full. Do you know, we talk about not having quick fixes, but there is a need to ensure that these changes do happen fairly quickly. So I'd like to know in terms of your role in respect of this, in conjunction with the police service, how we can bring about a system which people can truly have confidence in and, in, and ensuring that their needs are fully met like, via your organization. Um. I'll, I'll come to the point around uh, the learning recommendations. And I think what you're talking about here is, is the difference that happens. You know, what is the change that communities will see? So we've made sure to use the levers that we've got, the powers that we've got uh, to make the recommendations. The Met have accepted them. The next challenge is around actually making a difference in the areas that we've identified and for communities to see that change. Um, I would I would probably um, hand that over to my colleagues in MOPAC because my colleague MOPAC are the body that the Met are accountable for for the implementation of our recommendations. So uh, MOPAC have the ability to kind of scrutinise the Met as to what is actually happening in terms of the implementation and the delivery of change in terms of what we said the eleven stop and search learning recommendations we made. I know. Uh, Tasha and Jamie are on the call. I'm sure you'll get a chance to speak to them later, but that, that's something I would um, kind of pass on to my colleagues to move back to answer a bit more detail. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sure Natasha will answer that when I'll get in next. Do you want me to pick it up now, Chair? I could. No, no, I'm going to bring you in formally because I think you, we didn't have a written paper from you, despite being asked. Um, so I wonder if you've had an update for us. I do. Um, I've got. Um, and then perhaps you could um, 
answer that question because it's a very important question. It's really part of the crux of um, our work. And it'd be good to hear from about stop and search and handcuffing and uh, any progress that's been made on the Mayor's action report since um, last time. Yep, I will talk about all of those things. Oh, I do have a couple of slides that I'll just uh, talk to just to help the conversation. Let's just. Uh, we've got a text. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so um, thank you, Chair. I'm Natasha Plummer. I'm the Head of Engagement at the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime. Um, we're led by Sadiq Khan, who is the Police and Crime Commissioner for London, just in case, just to remind people on the call. Um, and as the Police and Crime Commissioner for London, he both sets the budget and the strategic direction for the Met and is responsible for overseeing um, their work and holding the Commissioner to account for delivery. Um, during every mayoral term, he will produce a police and crime plan, or she, um, and that sets out that strategic decision uh, direction over that mayoral term, which is partly what we use to hold the Met to account to. So you'll recall that the last time I came, we talked about the fact that over the summer we'd been doing um, a series of workshops looking at trust and confidence, uh, particularly within black communities. Um, and we spoke to a lot of people through that process, over 400 people uh, and many organisations working with um, and in black communities, from black communities. And we were very pointedly focused on black communities because we know we have significant uh, concerns within those communities and gaps in their levels of confidence and trust in policing versus other communities. Um, although I should caveat that by saying that confidence across all uh, communities has, has fallen in uh, more recent years. As a result of the work that we did over the summer, uh, we published an action plan uh, for uh, transparency, accountability and trust in policing. And it was published in November and it is organised across four themes. There are, over, there are about 40 actions in the plan, uh, the majority of which are, are now kind of in progress and we're working our way through all of those as we go through. Um, a full update on all of the actions across the plan was published in February 2021, which I can provide the links to for that chair, and a further update will be being published in the next few weeks in sort of early July. Um, now, the four themes across the plan uh, focus on um, areas that are all very relevant to the conversations you've been having here this evening and, and the last time we met. One is around uh, better use of police powers, which is all about how uh, the police use uh, their policing tools. So, you know, use of force, handcuffing tasers and stop and search, for example, uh, where we know there is some disproportionate impact on different communities, but also that it is an area that's particularly concerning to, to the public and has an impact on those trust and confidence measures. Uh, another area relates to how we work together with black communities to um, make them safer and um, that is all about how we engage with both the MOPAC and the MET uh, with communities about the work that we do, about policing that happens in their area and about community safety matters. Um, a further area of the plan relates to um, how the service represents and understands black communities. And that's particularly uh, relevant in terms of how we uh, both recruit officers, black officers to the service and increase those numbers. And the Met have some, you know, um, uh, ambitious targets around that, ambitious amb ambitions, they refer to them as they're not actually targets. Um, but also thinking about how you ensure that officers are equipped and trained and educated to be able to operate in the, the many diverse communities that they will have to work in, um, particularly if you have officers, for instance, who might have come from other parts of the country and not necessarily uh, been London resident um, uh, for as long. And that's always been one of the issues that's come up a lot. And then the final area is around, um, again, what we've been speaking about, how we hold the police to account for what they do. Um, and uh, we do uh, various different uh, things in that space, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. So I think in terms of the specific questions that, I, that were put to me and some of the conversation that's been happening this evening, there are three areas that I'll kind of talk around and then, you know, I'll take other questions that I'm sure will arise. The first is around our community engagement activity and what we're doing about that. The second is around data transparency. And then the third piece is about that accountability. So on the community engagement front, you'll recall that in the action plan, we made a commitment to overhaul our community engagement structures and we're, we're reviewing them. Um, we will be reviewing them. That's involved mapping some of the activity that already exists, and we're now working towards establishing uh, what would be our new community engagement framework. Now, that work will involve communities uh, across London, you know, in Hackney and elsewhere. It will include the safer neighbourhood boards, the community monitoring groups, all our existing groups, but also wider communities within that work. 
Now, we know that the mechanisms we have in place, so the monitoring groups that look at stop and search, for example, and the safer neighborhood boards, you know, they have been in place for, for quite some time now. And we know they're not as well known, perhaps, or, or as representative as we'd like them to be. And that they're not necessarily in a position actually to be shouting about the good work that they may be doing in, in their various areas. Um, now, these were set up under a previous administration, so they've been around for a long time. Um, but in terms of how those groups are structured and how they bring people on board, um, we provided them with lots of upfront investment, given that we're a long way away from the ground. And we spent quite a lot of time setting them up. And we provided a broad framework within which we, we expect them to operate. So they have kind of... Um, you know, model terms of reference and some set of expectations where we expect them to engage what we expect them to be working on. And they're given kind of fairly broad scope to operate within that framework. Now they do this, but you know, we, it's become apparent and we know that they really need more ongoing support for the work that we want them to do. And, you know, we have um, over the years, you know, delivered some of that through MOPAC, but also through local authorities, but certainly financial pressures of more recent years and indeed the ongoing capacity that you need to support them, um, you know, is becoming more and more critical. Um, so within the current framework, we do um, advise local groups about being more diverse and encourage them to think about how they can be more inclusive. Um, but we don't have a direct role in recruiting people to those groups. Now, um, we would naturally expect them to have a better understanding of their local and local communities and indeed they do because they're much closer to the ground than we are at the center um, but i think there are some challenges in that for them so one of the questions has to be for me is you know what are the barriers uh, to people being involved in those mechanisms are they still fit for purpose and i make no judgment about whether they are or aren't at this point but i think we have to seriously ask ourselves those questions if we want to make progress and we're doing that work you know and we'll be doing that we're continuing that work with communities because you know, I can post some answers to those questions. I may have some opinions about that, but actually we want to understand what people's, you know, real experience and expertise is in those spaces um, so that we build something that is actually will work for communities on the ground. Now, the next phase of our work around the action plan aims to address these issues. Um, and we know that, you know, some of the key things we want to make sure is that those groups are more diverse and representative. Um, we want to know how we can enable that. And that will in include talking to lots of different groups to kind of build the new framework. And, you know, as I said, that will take in existing groups. It will take in some of our key stakeholders who we're already talking to. So people like Hackney Account, who I know you've worked with a lot, um, have already informed quite a lot of the work around the action plan and been involved in a lot of those conversations um, in, in the generality. And, you know, will continue to be invited to be in those conversations with us. We've got a meeting coming up um, in early July um, where we'll be talking about some more of this with communities. So uh, I think that'll be a really, really helpful point uh, for us to get to. In relation to the data transparency piece, now that I think is a really important element of the work that we do. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have a lot of data that is already in the public domain, but I think that um, you would probably confer with this that actually, that concur, I should say, that, you know, that data is not necessarily as visible as we'd want it to be, that people don't necessarily know it's there. So we're doing some work thinking about how we're going to promote that and make that more accessible to people. But one of the things that we have done as part of the action plan is produce the new race equality dashboard, which I did talk about last time. Um, and that brings together a range of data to help us better understand disproportionality across all of the data sets that we have, it brings them all together in one place. So ranging from data in our public attitude survey, which tells us about differences in levels of trust and confidence, all the way to use of force data and stop and search data. And it's put it all in one place. So that data exists already and is already published, but we've sort of brought it together so people can see it through the, the um, uh, dispropor disproportionality lens in one place. So just trying to make that conversation easier for people. Um, and that was published, as I say, at the end of February, and there'll be a further update to that data um, this quarter. There was um, a specific question put to me about the public attitude survey and um, thinking about how we use our public surveys and how we get people to respond to those surveys. And I think the question was whether or not we could do a campaign to promote them and get more people to respond. But uh, if I just explain about the survey, one of the things about the survey, it's a bit more like the crime survey for England and Wales, which some of you may be familiar with. 
there is a representative sampling technique. So people are identified and approached to respond to the survey by an independent organization that does this on our behalf. We don't have anything to do with collecting the data. Um, and so we don't, it's not an advertised opportunity. You're not in, you know, you, they are approached as people who would be representative in the sample. Um, but one of the things that we have done in terms of trying to um, both increase representation, but actually to amplify some of the voices that we want to make sure that we're getting enough data from is that we've boosted the number of black respondents that are included within the sample. So that will be boosted up to a thousand people um, in a quarter because actually we want to be able to make sure that we can really understand and get underneath the different experiences in that community. And we wanted to have more data to be able to do that. So we have done that. Um, and then the third area I was going to talk about was around accountability. Um, now, we exercise our oversight functions, and this is kind of playing into the conversation that just took place, um, in a number of ways. We do that by, um, you know, how we publish and monitor various data sets, and we do that by holding the commissioner to account and her senior team through formal oversight and one-to-one -one meetings. And there are a number of different meetings that, that happen in that space. And I think the data transparency around that is really, really important because that enables both MOPAC and the public to see the data and interrogate it. It's in addition to that, we work with communities and we're enabling community scrutiny of key aspects of policing, so like stop and search and police custody through our custody visitors. And I think that wider community engagement piece is also relevant in that it helps us and the net actually understand how communities experience policing on the ground. So does what we think happen play out according to policy intent on the ground or is something different happening? And you can't understand that necessarily just from quantitative data, the qualitative bit that people tell us about is also really important in that space. And so one of the things that will happen, we have our regular kind of oversight. We've got a regular rhythm of um, oversight boards, a bit like you're doing now, this kind of thing where we'll look at, we've got a number of um, uh, regular data sets that we look at. We have the MIPS business plan, and then the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime, Sophie Linden, is holding the commissioner to account and talking to her about what is happening in that data, you know, where things are going in the wrong direction, actually trying to get underneath what those issues are. And, you know, holding people's feet to the fire when necessary, but, you know, just trying to work that through and apply the right kind of um, leverage and inquisition, I guess, to make the right things happen. And that happens on a regular rhythm. In between all of that, there are also um, regular meetings with all of the commissioner's senior team, so all the assistant commissioners, so, you know, the lead for territorial policing, frontline policing, the lead for learning and development and training, the lead for um, counterterrorism. All of, all of those people are also in those conversations with the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime because we have the whole range of data sets that we can see and use that to kind of monitor performance and dig into the areas where we think we've got particular concerns. So, for instance, um, we know through some of those tools, we knew that trust and confidence was going down and we were already digging into that particular problem. And then we could see when we looked beneath the data, as I say, that there were particular issues in uh, around black communities and how much less confident and trust trusting they were of the police. You could start to see that through the data so we could start to dig in uh, on that. So we're, we're tracking extensive amounts of data. And that will include things from, you know, stop and search data, as you're, you're well aware about, hate crime, you know, trust and confidence, domestic and sexual violence, officer numbers and uh, abstractions. So the number of officers who were taken away from their local community beats, for instance, we're tracking all of that data and we are publishing it so that the public can hold, you know, uh, can scrutinize both the Met and ask questions. They can ask us questions um, and, you know, be testing kind of the work that we're doing in that space. So I think probably I should stop there. Um, and allow you to ask some, some more questions perhaps that you will have and just take the conversation from there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Who's got questions? Anyone got a question? I've got a question, Chair. Okay, so who's that? Soraya. Soraya. Oh, sorry, Chair. Oh, see you Looking in the wrong screen for you. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Natasha, for that oversight. Um, I think it's particularly helpful to see that MOPAC does recognise the disproportionate treatment of black citizens across um, London, despite the fact that Cressida Dick does not recognise there being a problem. So thank you for that. But also what I kind of wanted to touch upon is, I had a quick kind of read through the action plan. Mm -hmm. but, um, I think we're 40 years on from Scarman, 20 years on from McPherson, and within that, the changes 
haven't been significant enough for many people across many, many demographics. Um, so I can see what you are, what you're intending to do over the implementation of this, but specific outcomes aren't readily available in that. So I'd like to know what you foresee happening as a result of this. Okay, more police officers and so forth, fair enough, but how will that manifest itself over recent years in respect of the, I mean, yeah, we've just been on a, a perpetual cycle of various from SUS through to kind of current policies in terms of stop and search, which have changed by name, but the outcomes are always the same. So I'd like to know what specifically you foresee happening as a, re as a result of this action plan. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the mayor is, has been um, really clear. We've been talking about this in the last week. You know, actually, what, what specifically are the two key outcomes that we're aiming to achieve? by all of the work, through all of the work that we do in the action plan. Um, and I should say that the work in the action plan isn't the entirety of everything. There is other work, obviously, that, that goes on that hasn't been caught within that. Um, but there is a whole range of work that both we and the Met are doing that would, would um, address partly this agenda. And the two key measures, really, for, for Sophie Linden and for the Mayor is one is improving trust and confidence and the other is reducing disproportionality. So they are going to be the two, that's the kind of litmus test of whether or not what we're doing makes a change. I think the third thing that we will want to measure, and I say measure, but temperature check and understand is about that community experience. So there is the potential for us to move the dial on the data. And actually, you know, to be fair to the service, things have changed a lot, you know, since Garment, an awful lot. Many things are different. But as you say, if you speak to people, their experiences and how they perceive that and how they, they experience the service, doesn't feel to them like it has changed. And that is the kind of third point. We actually have to have changed how people feel about the service, how they perceive it, how they experience it, regardless of whether or not we change the data. So I think that those, those are the three key things. I think the thing that we have that's really important about the plan is yes, we've had other plans and yes, there have been um, kind of previous reports. I think the key thing about this one is that one, um, we were really clear that what we were creating was an action plan. We didn't create recommendations. These are actions. These are things we are going to do. Um, and the Met are going to be, you know, held to account for doing. Um, so this isn't you know, a pick and mix menu of stuff you can do if you want to. This is actually the Mayor's strategic direction. It's going to be rolled into the police and crime plan. So it will be part of our statutory delivery. Um, so there's a full expectation that that will happen. I think the second thing that's I would say is different about this is the way in which we went about developing the plan and how we ourselves are opening ourselves up to be held to account as well as the Met for getting it done. So we did this work very deliberately with communities and involved them, you know, from the very beginning in devising, you know, sense checking whether or not we'd understood the problem, then talking to them about, well, what do you think are the answers to the problem as opposed to telling them? And actually, which are the most important things within that that you want us to tackle? So we've got a really clear mandate, I think, from, from communities about what are the things they really care about? And I think both us and the Met have real clarity on what those things are. And because we've kind of opened ourselves up um, and we have committed to kind of keeping in communities in that conversation, talking to us, working with us to develop things, there is every opportunity for the public to be holding us to account every step of the way. And, and believe me, they will, they do. Um, <laughs> our feet are also being held to the fire on this. So I think there's a lot of commitment. And, and I think, you know, I know there was... You know, there was quite a lot of feedback, I'd say, from community and partners about some of the, the the statements that came out of the Met in the weeks after. And I know there were some concerns about that. But I, I think that you can be assured that they're in no doubt that this is, you know, really one of the top things for the Mayor. It's one of the five things that he has said that, you know, needs to get done. Um, and the Met has orientated their resources towards getting this done and being in this game. Um, so I think there's a lot of commitment behind it. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Natasha, I, I've got a question that comes at this from a slightly different angle. Uh, something that this Commission has sort of um, seen and raised questions about over a, a number of years is, is the extent to which the connection between communities and the officers that are responsible for sort of safety within them is has been slowly but surely dissolved in the way the organization of the force across london has been um regionalized and to a certain extent centralized uh, you know i i bring to mind or it brings to mind the the, the, the um 
the the uh, territorial kind of support groups and the sort of centralized um, uh, sort of tactical kind of support units that that, that the that the Met now has. Um, and and the impact that, that that we can see that has in, in Hackney is that um, you know notwithstanding these other sort of institutional and organisational sort of challenges there are within within officer behaviour, there's just very simply a disconnect between the officers um, charged with policing and the communities that they are um, you know policing in because because one week or one day they may be. Uh, you know, responding to situations in Hackney, and 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 the following day they may be responding to situations in Croydon or in Bromley or in other areas, the capital. And you know, there are understandable organisational reasons and uh, why, why Mopac has directed the sort of organisation of the force in that way. But I'd be interested to know: is this a uh, an issue that that Mopac is? Um, is interrogating uh, to understand you know how how that kind of plays into the, the issues that we're talking about here and is there anything in the in the plan for the forthcoming period to to, to maybe unwind some of these moves and to try and return the kind of connection between police officers and, and the communities that they um are responsible for keeping safe thank you thank you um, I, I will start on that but i think probably um Marcus might want to come in about the local, I would have thought. Um, I mean, it is it is a point point well made, I think, um, in terms of that being like a concern that is raised with us quite a lot. I should start by kind of explaining that the way in which the service is organised is, is not a MOPAC mandated thing. Um, you know, the commissioner has, a, a you know, command and control and can organise the resources how, how she deems fit. And, you know, this was one of the changes that were made. Um, to rationalise resources and I guess maximise them. Now, there may be some potential disbenefits to that, but I think they've tried to mitigate that to some degree. So one of the things that um, we've obviously tried to do is one, in terms of that regionalised piece is, you know, get some uh, recognition from the Met. And I think they do recognise this about the need for, you know, the, bar the BCU commander to have good connections across the whole of their area. And I think that they do. I think Marcus does. He feels well connected to Hackney to me, even though he has other areas of responsibility. So I think that strategic connection is well made. Uh, in terms of the local resourcing and the dedicated ward officers and the people who are out on the beat, um, when obviously when Sadiq was elected in the first term, uh, he put additional officers into those teams. Um, and there were commitments about the levels of abstractions or not abstractions from those beats and kind of keeping people in their patches. With the additional uplift in police officer numbers and the additional money obviously we've got from government and the big recruitment that is going on in, in London, we do have an opportunity to boost those um, local numbers and there is work underway to kind of do the maths and work out actually how we get more people into those local, more officers into their local areas. So not just kind of using the officers in the big task force groups and the TSGs, but thinking about those local delivery teams. Um, and I, Marcus may pick this up too, but I do know that around some of those, um, that there are obviously the, ta the TSGs, you know, the violence suppression units, all these other teams that can come in and work on boroughs. Um, you know, that that is challenging, you're, you're right, because they're not necessarily on your borough all of the time. Um, but I do think there is um, quite a bit of work underway in parts of the Met, and, and uh, Commander Connors might also want to comment on this, around thinking about, you know, how TSG is briefed when they go into local areas. Um, I know in Harringay, and I, I'd imagine it would be the same in Hackney, you know, they go in and they talk to the local teams before they're actually, they actually deploy and kind of get the lie of the land, try to understand a bit more about that local context, exactly for the reason that you're talking about. Um, and also TSG do a lot of, um, do do a lot of community engagement actually they're out in the community a lot uh working with young people doing outreach um so they they recognize that distance themselves and, and are trying to address it i'd say um marcus do you want to come in are you there we come back to Marcus. Um, can I take you back to your commitment? Um, you talk about the action plan. Yep. And let me put you back. So, if we had another meeting, like we say, just for instance, next spring, early next spring, what would you what would you think that we should be expecting as um, difference between now and uh, next spring? What do you think? We'll be seeing differently in regards to handcuffing, stuff searching, disproportionality, 
So on the on the bigger picture piece, obviously, as I said, we'll be tracking um, trust and confidence and we'll be tracking uh, disproportionality. I don't necessarily think we'll move the dial much on those particular measures in that period of time, not at the headline level. That will take a long time to show itself in the data. What I would hope, though, is that there are um, also uh, local level surveys that are being run through frontline policing, for instance, where they are talking to local communities and doing some targeted work that you might see some uh, under the line changes in the way those um, relationships are operating and how people feel about them. I think with the Met kind of ramping up the amount of engagement that they're doing um, in the local community, uh, plus the work that we'll be doing around kind of the work we're doing on the action plan and keeping those um, conversations going with local communities, I would like to think that people will begin to feel differently about the nature of the relationship. Now, that's not an easy thing to measure, but actually, you know, when people are unhappy, they're quite happy to tell us, <laughs> you know, actually you will, you will hear that as, as local councillors and we will get that as MOPAC um, and you and the Met will get that too. And actually, if you can start to shift the dial on some of that, then you know things are travelling in the right direction, even if you can't measure it in the actual data. Um, in terms of, um, you know, more specific things around things like the, the community engagement work, in the next six to nine months, so in the, by the next financial year, um, we will have um, you know developed our new community engagement framework and be implementing be implementing that. We will start probably some of that implementation this financial year, um, but that's the sort of incremental process. Um, certainly, we will be focusing our earlier efforts around that work on probably the stop and search elements of that as being the most most critical in terms of. Um, where we know there are significant issues around trust and confidence and actually wanting to really be in that space and enabling people to be holding the police to account around that more effectively and also enabling them to know that it happens and have confidence that there is, you know, various levels of scrutiny happening around stop and search particularly. Um, so you will see some, some progression in those particular areas, which I think will um, chime with the work that you've been doing. Has anybody else got any questions? Councillor Rathbone. Um, yeah, I, I just, um, yeah, I, I, I'm hearing what, what you just said. Um, I'm just concerned about this whole thing with uh, community engagement is that, um, uh, I don't know how to put this, but, you know, you're saying about we've consulted with people, but yet, you know, when I talk to certainly young people on the ground, but other people as well, I've never heard of MOPAC. They've never heard of being consulted. And I kind of wonder, how is that being done? I mean, I, I'm obviously, you, you could be very complicated here, but just very simply, how, how is that done? Um, and, and how is that um, reported back as well? So that when you were consulting people, you then report back exactly what, what's happening and what, 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 you're, what you're planning to do. And then um, I also just wanted, in connection with that, to, wondered how you saw police walled panels because in this borough they're, they're quite active in various places and the police do make a great deal of effort to report back and, and hear what people have to say and I wondered how, how that fitted in. And then finally, thirdly, just a, a question around that. I, I always remember Sue Williams, who was uh, Mr Barnett's uh, predecessor, coming and telling us and I was so impressed with what she had to say about actually engaging uh, people from John Lewis's to begin to train the police 
in how to deal with anger management, how to deal with difficult customers, as it were, on the street. And I wondered where that where that had kind of gone, that because she's unfortunately moved on and. you know that, that that was quite an impressive piece of understanding that you know you do need to understand how to deal with difficult customers and obviously people who work in retail are probably the best people to to help you to understand more about um, other people and, and how they they think as against how you might think or behave thank you um so uh you're, you're quite right. We have a bit of a profile problem as the Mayor's Office for Policing and Grime. Um, everybody knows who the Mayor of London is, but they, they won't know Mopac probably if you say that to them, or indeed if you call it by its full title. Um, and, and we are well aware of that. Um, our work, we do that through a number of mechanisms. So across City Hall, we have large stakeholder groups and large stakeholder networks um, that we work with, which will include all of our own kind of commission service providers, as well as our existing community engagement structures. Um, and then, you know, working with VCSE providers to kind of network out into other organisations. So we certainly don't hit everybody. Um, we have our um, annual programme of surveys, so victim satisfaction and public attitudes, uh, which we um, survey kind of representative samples of Londoners, so we get a representative view in that data. But what we do try and do through that is to work with kind of networked organisations. Um, so at the individual level, you know, that's much more difficult for us because we're a centralised team of only three people, four people. Um, and so we have to try and work through our networks. Can we do more? Yes, we can. Do we try to work with other partners to kind of cascade and amplify messages? Yes, we do. But, you know, that is something we will certainly want to do more of. Um, and the thing to say about the kind of consultation piece and the engagement is that, you know, it isn't finished. So this is going to be a, an ongoing process. And, you know, all the time we are bringing new people to the conversation, actually, as those people who are in the conversation are telling others. So the first, um, we, we had a couple of meetings before Christmas and maybe we had sort of 60 people in the room, 70 people. As we've gone through, we're having more and more people kind of coming to those regular conversations that we're having. So those numbers are growing. Um, well, I, I can't promise you that that means that, you, you know, every person you find on the street will necessarily know about them. They probably won't. Um, the other piece that we are doing alongside this is looking at our wider comms around the action plan, but also just in general about MOPAC, but particularly about the action plan um, and trying to develop kind of more channels for doing that. How do we work with young people and use digital channels, kind of hit that particular audience who, you know, quite frankly, they're not reading press releases from the mayor, are they? And they're probably not at this meeting either. So they're not hearing what I'm saying. Actually, we have to think about how we're meet reaching some of these audiences where they are rather than bringing them to us. Um, so we're doing some kind of um, analysis around those different communities and gaps and people that we want to be talking to and then trying to target our communications to them. Um, in terms of ward panels, so, I mean, that's good to hear that you you have, you know, good ward panels in your borough quite active and that the police support them well. Um, they are part of that wider engagement landscape and we will, along with the central team, be looking at some of that. Um, I don't know that what that means in, in the long run, but we will kind of think about that because we know across London that they vary in terms of, you know, how effective they are, how representative they are. They suffer from some of the same problems as our other mechanisms. Um, and we would want to think about how we might work with the Met to address that too. Um, so that's all in the mix to a certain degree. Uh, on the final part about John Lewis, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if Marcus does or Jane on the line, if we can get them back. Um, but I'm not aware of that at all. Sharon, could I ask a question? Yeah, that would be the last question. It's, it's just a, a very quick follow-up to that question, really, which is um, which is about your budget. Um, you're obviously putting a lot of, uh, well, it seems to be a lot of, of uh, effort into community engagement, which is a good thing. I just wonder if your budget for community engagement has gone up or not. Mm. No, it hasn't. <laughs> uh, not at this point. No, it absolutely hasn't. Um, but uh, a part of the thing, reason for that is that obviously, as we develop the new frameworks, then I think we have to revisit what those budgets look like. At the moment, um, the funding is. Can you excuse me one moment? There's a noise behind me. Um, sorry about that. Noisy household. 
Uh, so there is, um, at the moment, our budgets are fed into the safer neighbourhoods largely, and they use that both to run kind of their meeting structure, but also to invest in local projects. Um, going forward, that probably won't be the model, but the local projects piece, I think, perhaps will, will fall away and it will be more focused on the kind of engagement activity, I imagine, but I don't know the answer to that question. So it'll probably be that we'll repurpose some of that money. But at the moment, we haven't increased the budget, but I do think we will have to think about, well, how do we want to use the money? You know, how do we ensure there's effective support for those groups on, a, on an ongoing basis? And that might require more budget. Um, and we'll kind of get to those those decisions um, when we get nearer kind of knowing what the answer to the what we want to do is. Mm. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Natasha. It's been very useful. I'm yeah. going to break for five minutes now. Thank you, Natasha. Thank so, you. Thank you. Cut, I'm sure there'll be questions to you as part of the next part of the discussion with the police. So please don't go away. Thank you. <laughs>
points. This is a bit of Yes. If you'll need to challenge. Yeah, would you like to so, would you like to come in please, uh, Commander Barnett? Chief Sir. Yeah. Are you asking me to come in? Yes, please. Yes, please. <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here. I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you too. Just going into Q and A. Yeah, the members. Uh, since you did a presentation, and I hope all members have read it. Um, has anybody got questions? Silence. I'm a bit confused. Is it? Uh, I thought he was going to be coming back on some of the stuff that we've already seen. Do you want to perhaps come back on some of the stuff that just has been raised mm -hmm. and uh, that Natasha uh, and uh, Nessa, the IOPC, um, said was the place? Or perhaps uh, so. uh, Commander Con Connors will want to respond to that? Um, yeah, um, obviously I'm, I'm very much in your hands. Um, I was um, obviously waiting for you to ask me um, obviously any questions you wish. So what is it you'd like me to um, talk about first? I, I've got a question for you. I mean, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, obviously, um, the account group aren't with us today and I believe that the police... I can't are... hear you, I'm afraid. Sorry. Sorry, I'm surprised. Um, I just wanted... Um, about challenge to the to the um, the account group was very was quite a challenge to uh, the your uh, the place in their uh, the aspects of uh, their work and certainly held you to account. Um, looking at the people that you work with now, um, they don't uh, none of them were specifically set up to challenge or work with, work on. Um, the way that the police interact with uh, the community. They are community groups. I, I, I recognise the Quest and uh, Badger Spots. I mean, obviously, um, Morningside. Um, the people that you work with now, um, they don't, uh, none of them are specifically set up to challenge or work. Sorry, Chair, it, it's such a dreadful line. I think the question was. Um, are we still working with the account group? Was that was that the question? That's part of the question. Also, um, who are you? The groups that you're working with, uh, they're very general groups, and I wonder, um, perhaps, who is actually who you're working with that actually monitors you? Um, is is it, are you working with anyone that just? Who's set up just to monitor uh, things like stop and search and the way the police react with the community? Because the groups that you seem to be working with are quite broad community groups who uh, are not set up to do that. Right. I, I think your question was who are we who are we working with over and above the account group. Well, we're still working with the account group, as you'll probably be aware, um, Chair and. Um, we were meeting with them only probably about six weeks ago with the mayor, um, Phil Glanville, Susan Pajama Thomas, Councillor Thomas, and um, we had the TSG and members of the account group. So we are still most certainly working with the account group. Um, and obviously they advise the local authority. And um, so we're very much working with them. And as you've already touched upon, we are working with uh, Hackney Voyage, so Paul Anderson and uh, his team, and they provide advocacy and scrutiny, particularly around terms of reference agreed with Section 60s. Um, we obviously have our own community um, work going on in terms of monitoring groups. We've got a police encounter scrutiny group, which we um, have set up, community monitoring groups. We have an innovation hub working through the MOPAC Action Plan, Commander Haydari, We've had three sessions with 30 young people per session from various different schools and parts of Hackney community, uh, talking about um, policing, the context, how we establish the solutions to policing and improve engagement. 
uh, we are working uh, obviously with the local authority and your good selves. You're part of the holding us to account piece, as well as the independent advisory group, safe and neighbourhood boards. You've heard from uh, obviously the IOPC and we have various other different monitoring groups which look very closely at what we are doing. And part of that is recently setting up police encounter panels, looking at body-worn video footage and looking at the way that we operate. And in terms of other groups that we are engaged with, of course, we've got our youth engagement plan, where we work very closely across, across 20 priority schools and colleges. Uh, we've got over 200 cadets which represent young people in themselves. I think we've probably got the largest youth club in Hackney. Uh, we've got our own youth engagement officers. And over and above Badu Sports that you've mentioned, we've got Hackney Quest, Parents Voice, Salam Peace, The Crib, uh, Morningside, Youth Ward Panel, Shoreditch Trust, uh, Fame Start Youth, Ted's Rose, Sports Club, Kicks, Connections, Ocean, Morningside, the Osmani Trust, and so it goes on that we are working with very closely in a really comprehensive trust and confidence engagement plan. So what are they saying to you? in regard on trust and confidence these young people in these community groups because uh, that would be very interesting to know what they're saying to you and uh, how you're taking on board what's said to you. Well, what, what I can say is um, in the last six months or so, um, I think we've seen some really positive uh, improvements in the work around trust and confidence that we're seeing. Um, the, you've obviously have the satisfaction surveys um, where we have seen lots of uh, improvements in that area. And clearly, you know, the conversations that we have through the young people and through everybody that we engage with, um, you know, what we must remember is overall about 80% of Londoners support and trust the Metropolitan Police Service. And um, we are absolutely, you know, aware and completely, you know, focused on improving our policing response. Uh, and that's something that I've said repeatedly through these, um, through these sessions. Um, when particularly talking about trust and confidence, stop and search, section 60 is use of force. And I think what you're starting to see, you know, is some real improvements. If you look at stop and search, for example, we're now averaging 28 something percent uh, positive outcome rates, which is significantly higher than it's previously been. We're far more focused around our use of section 60. Uh, the MET itself are doing a, a significant amount of work in sort of training one about culture training awareness. I'm working with uh, members of the black community linked very closely to Rasha and Charles's family uh, to get an understanding of some of the community tensions. And um, overall, I would say, you know, and not in any way complacent, uh, that we have got a way to go, but we are an improving picture. The community by and large seem, uh, certainly those that we're engaged with, um, you know, there is a, a level of, I think, improving trust and confidence. Um, and we will continue to work, you know, in that vein. One of the things that you said you were going to do was a review of um, body wall cameras um, and stop and search. You were going to uh, do it with some of your officers and get some members of the community to uh, come and do that with you. I wonder if it's been done and also uh, what was the outcome and uh, how you recruited uh, members of the community that did it with you? Yeah, so we have, um, we, we reviewed uh, over 800, I think it was, stop and search. And I think we'd had this conversation previously uh, where we'd given some of the headline um, sort of findings of the use of force, stop and search, proportionality, the grounds, uh, body worn video, looking at our learning and development teams uh, and identifying officers that are particularly adept at stop and search. And interestingly enough, um, it's been mentioned earlier on in terms of, uh, I think it was a question around connection with the police, where we talked about the local TSG officers. Um, and um, I have to say, I, I do really disagree. I had this conversation with the account group recently. Um, the, the TSG, for example, have some of the highest stop and search positive outcome rates in London. Uh, and not, not, not that many complaints at all. I think it's a bit of a misconception when they do come into Central East and Tower Hamlets and Hackney, as they do all over London, they are very well briefed. Uh, they are brilliantly led, in my opinion, and they do a fantastic job supporting London and keeping London safe. You know, as do the violent crime task force that we bring into Hackney, the uh, Rose Transport Policing Command, the Firearms Command and Specialist Crime. 
and um, you know we we have a number of resources you know coming in. But um, back to the point. So we have done a big review of stop and search. Uh, we also have now monitoring groups looking at stop and search. We are, as I said, just about to set up something called the police encounter panels, which you may have heard from Commander Catherine Roper, who works at Scotland Yard. That's something that is being launched, and um, we will be uh, very much front and centre of that. And that is uh, an independent process looking at body worn video footage of such things as stop and search or incidents that have been in the media where sometimes there's only a very small snapshot that's shown to the public, which doesn't actually show, you know, as in somebody's social media footage, doesn't show the full picture. And we are going to be bringing people in, and that's just about to be launched. So um, we're kind of already on that journey. And again, the vast majority of people, it's rather like the IOPC uh, earlier on, that very helpfully was sort of obviously outlining to the group um, the way that sort of complaints are being looked at and the numbers are upheld or not. And um, I have to say, I do think with this significant amount of work that's going on within the Met, um, you know, we are starting to see certainly improvements uh, one and around, the, you know, the, the way stop and search is used, the, the use of stop and search, uh, the use of force, the training, the cultural awareness, which again, we are working very close with the local authority, cultural awareness and other community groups. Okay, so I suppose it's, I've put the same question as you as I've put to Natasha. If I'm have, afraid I can't hear you, sorry. Uh, it's either one of your colleagues uh, going on behind me or... Uh, yeah, it's, it, I, I'm, 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 I do apologise. It's, it's a very busy place, as you know. I'm uh, sure it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just tell me to turn the, the Hussars of Mega Fast and Town Hall. Uh, <laughs> Just for the two seconds, uh, I'm only joking. Uh, but yeah, if I asked you to come, if you came back to us, say six to nine I can't months. I hear you. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm if you sorry. came back to us in six to nine months' time, what changes would we see? I mean, you've talked about all this um, community engagement and that training that's going on. Um, and that you've done the review, um, but you still haven't told, you still haven't said who the community people, who the community was, and how you recruited them that sat on the review. So, what difference would people who are who are dissatisfied with the way uh, the Met um, do stop and search, particularly around? the diversity of the way that the Met do stop and search and the number of black young men that are outnumbered in the way that you do stop and search, you know, will we see a difference in stats in the sense that, um, that black young men will no longer be, um, be the people that are being stopped and searched? Will there be more proportionality? You know, what, what will the changes be? You talked about all the work that's going on. I've heard we heard from Natasha about the work that's going on in the MOP, MOPAC. You know, people want to see change. Yeah, um, it's great that the Met is working um, to try and change, and we realise it's probably a bit like turning around an ocean liner. Um, it takes a bit of time. You can't do it on the sixpence. But uh, people out there do want to see change and want to know what change is going to be. And I'm not sure that we've heard that yet. No. Yeah getting nods from uh, people around the table about uh, what the change is going to be and what we're going to see because no one's actually told us that. Yeah, I think it's a really good question and um, I, I, I can tell you what I, I hope we're going to see um, and I can say what um, undoubtedly is going to be um, my focus of attention and my team going forward. So what I hope we're going to see is far less violence on the streets in Hackney as we do all over London with uh, very sadly um, when I do see violence on the streets, uh, predominantly uh, the victims of crime um, are certainly that I see at the moment in parts of Hackney um, young black men um, subjected to serious levels of violence and I do hope we're going to see far less victims on the streets uh, because clearly, you know, that is just absolutely dreadful. I hope we're going to see a reduction in violence, period. I hope we're going to see a reduction in weapons being used in violence and firearms and such like. And of course, what that means um, is what you are going to see from the police is a continued use 
um, of all of our legal powers in a very proportionate, balanced way, uh, with an improving picture around training awareness uh, of the communities, the pavements that we walk, uh, cultural awareness, stepping into people's shoes and trying to gain a greater understanding. We do know that there is low confidence in the black community, and we are, as you've heard already, working very closely around that. And I hope that we will continue to see uh, an improvement in trust and confidence, an improving engagement picture where people want to work with us. I really hope that I'm going to see members of uh, this panel, other uh, influential members of the community coming out and seeing the police themselves firsthand of what my officers, your officers have to endure on the streets to keep people safe. I think that's absolutely crucial to have a really balanced, strong conversation about policing because it is so complex and there are so many challenges. And I really hope that we are going to see, as a one, a reduction in crime, particularly violence. I hope we're going to see increased trust and confidence. We're going to see my officers improving in what they do because I have every ambition that's going to be the case. And I said this over a year ago, and we're starting to see the fruits of that. I, I, yes, the Metropolitan Police is a big organisation. Um, it's commented on earlier on about the Daniel Morgan panel, and I won't make too much reference to that. Um, but I am very much like the Commissioner. We are not an institutionally corrupt organisation. I do not believe we're institutionally racist. But do we have um, areas that we need to improve? Absolutely. And um, but where there are those kind of activities and those behaviours, they are rooted out. And um, so I hope, panel, and I hope, Chair, that you will see over the next six months, as everybody else will across Hackney and Tower Hamlets that I'm in, in charge of, you will see a continuing improvement picture around trust and confidence, reduction in crime, people that are committing crime, and we mustn't ever forget that, people that are committing crime and causing absolute misery and creating havoc on the streets, um, that they will be taken off the streets, and I still believe that's what the vast majority of the public want, and that's my duty, and that's our collective responsibility. Councillor Rad. Um, <clears throat> Amanda Barnett, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I've got sort of two areas of questions, really. Um, the first area is about the monitoring groups looking at the body cam footage, um, which I think is a really good initiative. Um, and I was sent a consultation before, it must be about two or three months ago now, um, because I know that the police were looking for a lot of young people to fill in the consultation. Um, and you were sort of reaching out to people in the community to forward it to young people. Um, so the first question really is, I, I filled out the consultation. I know I wasn't the target group really, but you know, I thought my views might be interesting. Um, I wondered how many young people had filled in that consultation, how much response you'd got, and how much you were able to take young people's views into account when you were framing the terms of reference for the monitoring groups who will be looking at the body cam footage. Second question linked to the body cam footage is, are you going to be uh, making a note of officers who are not successfully delivering body cam footage, i.e. are you keeping a note of those officers who regularly have technical problems with their body cams and uh, what will you do with that information? Um, and on a completely separate subject, I wanted to ask you about dispersal zones because one of the things that I've noticed is that in the last couple of months, uh, there have been some very regular applications for dispersal zones, in particular in the Dalston uh, Gillette Square area. There's been almost a constant dispersal zone in that area. Now, I know that there has been some problem in, in that area, and I think somebody was murdered there not so long ago, but, um, I, I do wonder about the connection between stop and search and dispersal zones. Am I correct in thinking that a dispersal zone makes it much easier for officers to stop and search people? And I suppose 
I had always imagined that a dispersal zone application was a short-term measure which was used in extreme circumstances. And to see uh, the regular applications for the Gillette Square dispersal zone becoming sort of semi-permanent in the last short while is a bit concerning to me. I wonder what your thoughts are. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, so just on the first point regarding the body-worn video footage consultation, um, I don't know the details of the final sort of outcome in terms of a consultation. I could certainly go back to Commander Roper, who I think is probably leading on that for the next, uh, and find out. But um, suffice to say that I am um, pretty sure, um, and I don't know the, day, the exact numbers, but of course, young people of London, of communities, will be consulted in terms of how do the police encounter panels, which is what I think they're being described as, um, are going to run and who is going to have access to them. Now, often when we run uh, panels such as this, um, we have people sign up to inclusion notices and we obviously have quite a strict and strong terms of reference. Um, it's not unusual for younger members of the community, they don't want to sign up to some of the strict terms of reference and the inclusion notices and such like. It's rather like trying to set up a youth IAG, an independent advisory group. When I asked um, the account group, for example, previously, um, they didn't want to be an independent advisory group in the truest sense of another advisory group that we have. So I don't know what the outcome of the consultation was and I don't know what it's going to look like moving forward in terms of the actual workings of these police encounter panels. But I would be very, very surprised if Commander Roper, knowing it very well as I do, and uh, you know, an incredible professional, is not really focused on the young people of London in this. Um, so your other point there about if we identify, and that's sort of a, a more broad point anyway, if we identify officers that aren't using body-worn video when they should, if they aren't um, using stop and search in a proportionate way, if they're not justifying the grounds for the search, if the encounter isn't as we would expect in terms of politeness, professionalism, using the you know the national decision making model, and using their use of force as they should be under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, and so it goes on. Absolutely, and colleagues from the IOPC and most packets they're on, they will probably also bear this out. Um, we are very robust in terms of, and certainly far better than we used to, in looking at the officers, is there a pattern of behaviour, what does some sort of learning, training, development need, is there actually a discipline issue, and we are at pains to make sure that those officers, and then any wider learning is promulgated across the BCU and beyond in, in other parts of London, so we are constantly improving. I think that's the picture we're all starting to see, an improving picture. Um, now, that, that sort of detail isn't obviously widely published uh, and made known, um, but suffice to say that through other levels of accountability, transparency and openness, through our local professional standards, the Department of Professional Standards of the Yard, and various different people, and we've got DAC Connors and other such people that will look at these things, as well as the IOPC, there is complete accountability in terms of our action and what we do. Uh, the point about dispersal zones, um, I don't know the actual nuance of legislation. I am aware that obviously dispersal zones do get put in. You've mentioned Gillette Square. There has been an ongoing uh, area of concern for the partnership, which you will be aware. And um, there have been numerous meetings of many, many months, uh, years, where there has been an improving picture in terms of designing out crime, CCTV, supporting businesses in the community. We did have a very tragic murder there only a few weeks ago. And um, obviously as a result of that, in, in line with some of the, the uh, obviously the street drinking community and um, some of the antisocial behaviour, we do put the dispersal zones in and we do that in many parts of London. Uh, where we feel it's necessary to sort of keep uh, volumes of crowds down, reduce antisocial behaviour and such like. But that does not mean that that makes it easier or it means that an officer has uh, less need to show a lawful, proportionate, balanced use of stop and search. They still have to, and it's exactly the same when a Section 60 gets put in place, where we believe that violence has been used, is about to be used, 
even though the Section 6 is in place, officers still have to justify their legal action of using stop and search. It's a myth to think that officers, the minute a Section 6 is in place or a dispersal zone is in place, the officers can just do carte blanche whatever they wish. It's absolutely not the case. They justify what they do in exactly the same way. Okay, I've got Morris Mason, yeah. Morris Mason and also Councillor Jera. Okay, Morris Mason, I'm over Community Safety and Partnership. Can I come in just on the Gillette Square in the use of Section 35 of the uh, Antisocial Behaviour Act 2014? It doesn't facilitate stop and search. So the first thing that I would say, and I've certainly uh, seen this, the use of Section 60, which does facilitate stop and search within our borough. Uh, I mean, I can't remember the last time the police has applied for one. In terms of the Section 35, we were pushing the police to put it in place for Gillette Square. It's not just the, the tragic murder of Patrick, Patrick Anzi, but it's also there's been somebody knotted there and knocked unconscious. Somebody stabbed there. There's been drug dealing in that particular area. If you go and speak to the business owners around there, they'll tell you how, how bad they perceive it to be there. And it's not just about enforcement, obviously. We've got a whole action plan in place that is definitely trying to treat the causes there. And the second area of Section 35 dispersal orders, which again, I'm fully in support of, is the nighttime economy. Which actually, we sent Council for Joanna Thomas a video uh, via the police, a montage of the, some of the disorder down there. And, I, you know, metaphorically it would make your hair stand on end if you were down there actually patrolling that particular area. So fully support those two, and they don't facilitate stop and search at all, in my opinion and experience. Back to you, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Jara. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chief Superintendent Barnett. Um, I think it's just kind of following on from Penny's uh, question in respect of accountability and the partners that you're planning to engage in respect of scrutiny and um, processes. I think in terms of accountability of officers, within that, you, you've touched upon it briefly, but I'm hoping that there is, in terms of training and development for officers who have incredibly high rates of non-actionable outcomes in, in respect to stop and search, I am hoping that that's data that can be shared as a, with whoever you've selected to scrutinise these processes with you. Um, and I'm hoping the council's had involvement in terms of that as well. Um, because in terms of dispelling the narrative that these stops, stop and search is disproportionate, despite you saying the numbers are going down, the community sense is that they're not. Um, and, and, and all the while they see the kind of middle class literati getting away with kind of snorting Charlie and selling it and not being put under the same kind of pressure as minority communities. And that, that, that's a deep concern for many, many people. Um, so I'm keen to find out how you're going to take that forward, whether the data is going to be shared amongst the um, groups scrutinizing what's going on or the changes or the progress that you're going to be making over the kind of coming months and years um yeah that's my kind of question thank you um council just so i'm clear so your question is um, are we going to be sharing data on stop and search uh, effectiveness uh, with partners yeah, i do think that I think where it's clearly there's been disproportionate and that, yeah, enforcement of that approach. I mean, I mean, you yourself know there's a common narrative, oh, the police stopping people by way of saying they could smell weed or they look or, or somebody looks suspicious, or they've got a hoodie over their head, they look like they're kind they they're leaving a crime scene. Do you know, I myself was being stopped, I haven't necessarily been searched, but the reasons given were the suspect. I looked lost making my way home through Hackney I'm in my car. What are you doing here? And asked to get out of my car on the local street. So <coughs> all these kind of narratives which are going on. And if there's a system by which we can identify which officers are implementing these processes disproportionately, 
not necessarily have to be named, but also there have been tangible outcomes in terms of the approach taken locally or, or London wide, so that we know that these changes are being kind of embedded in the processes that the police kind of bring about. So yeah, that that, that is it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I um so undoubtedly as part of the, sort of the policing council panels, the community monitoring groups that we have, we share all sorts of information with those people uh, that come in that are sort of included within that conversation and they get to see the body on video footage. And naturally, as you are quite rightly asking some of those questions, what do we do with those officers that we have identified that aren't necessarily performing as we would like, where there is a training need or, you know, on the odd occasion where we think there is something just more sort of serious going on, um, then yes, absolutely, they will get dealt with and we will be including with our partners and those that are part of that process <coughs> that detail to explain what we've seen what we found what we're going to do about it how we're going to be improving because of course that all goes to help you know driving up trust and confidence because you know what what we absolutely want and i've made the point and i'll say it again is you know we want as many people from the community to come in and to support us and to understand what we do, to look and recognize the collective challenge that we all have in trying to bring cohesion and safety to our communities. This is not just a police issue, absolutely far from it. So the more people that we can have to come in and work with us to see what we're doing, to understand, to help us improve. And also, um, as I said, you know, you would be absolutely welcome. I've said it to my, um, colleagues, uh, council colleagues and partners in Tower Hamlets, just very recently had the head of community safety out on a ride along with the police. And, um, you know, it was a, a, I think, a very enlightening and rich experience. And uh, as I said, please come on in, uh, spend as much time as you want with my officers um, out on the ground and see what it is that they have to do. And so we all have a shared experience. And yes, absolutely, we will be looking at that data and we will be sharing with those that are included in the process and working with us very closely. So, can I, yeah, so can I just, yeah, it's just full of, but in terms of the outcomes of that kind of scrutiny process, I think that's what's kind of foremost in people's minds. What actually happens if, if, if there's kind of pattern of behaviors well, it depends on what happened. It, it depends on what we found. I mean, obviously, it depends. It, well, one, the outcome of what we find, we hope leads to improving trust and confidence in terms of um, we are getting less resented stops. There is um, less use of force where it's not necessary, uh, increased positive outcome rates, and we are being a more professional, more personal in terms of our approach. That obviously is is my hope and we are starting to see that as i've said um and i think sort of moving forward into that when we do identify officers what can you expect me to do well if it's an officer that is just not pressing their body on video and putting them on or they're just not giving sufficient grounds in their stop and search if there is a training need and whatever that looks like they will get trained and they will be developed and that has a whole range of you know obviously areas that we could go into um, and if there's something more serious and it's a misconduct issue where they are just not performing in a kind of a legitimate, honest, professional way, as we would expect in as an organisation, in line with the code of ethics, in line with the law and in line with the requirements that are set out very clearly, you know, in terms of policing conduct, then, you know, absolutely they will get dealt with. Now, that could be anything from, you know, reflective practice misconduct by way of written warnings gross misconduct if it's really severe you've heard from the iopc tonight you know there is a huge range of measures all of which are very open um for the public to see and to understand um and for obviously members of the public to make a complaint should they feel necessary mark can i come back on that because i don't i think they it's not open and clear for members of the public to know uh, what's going on, um, the way that officers are dealt with. Uh, perhaps you could, I know Councillor Rosen wants to come in, but 
Perhaps you could tell us as members how you do, you say there's training, you know, there's training or there's misconduct. So when does, you've offered some officers not wearing body, not operating their cameras properly or whatever, or you think that their their judgment, I know it stands judgment of who they stop and search, we've asked you this before, and you keep telling us it's down to the officer's discretion. So when do you tell whether an officer's discretion it turns out to be something other than discretion um, and could be racist in the fact that, I don't know, they're only stopping black people or they never stop anybody else. I don't know. How do you tell these things? And how it's do you... Not, um, them? And yeah, how I do think you the word, I think the word... I think the word discretion, as you've described it there, is probably the wrong phraseology. It's not a word that I've used in this context. Officers do have, you know, the use of discretion, you know, they to use their powers as a constable of the Crown. You know, that is their responsibility They in how that they act and how that they respond within the context of the incident, the law. You know, they, they can use discretion. When an officer decides that they are going to stop somebody and they are then going to search somebody, it is the officers, it is that officer that has to justify, and that's the word, justify their actions. Now, if they have not done it properly, and it's an innocent issue, as in they haven't put their body on video on, the battery had run out of charge, or they haven't filled out the grounds properly, or they've got something slightly wrong or slightly out of order in terms of when they have to give what we call you know we have a very clear process by which when somebody is stopped we have to tell them the grounds for the search the object who we are why we're searching and where they can get hold of a stop search slip exactly etc now if some of that is not adhered to and it's a one-off then that officer may well be spoken to and said we've identified this if we if we've identified this in the stop and search um we've identified this you need to improve, you need to make sure X, Y, or Z. If it's the person that keeps coming to notice, and then it becomes a training issue, which is a bit more kind of in-depth, to say, well, actually, you now need some more one-to-one -one training, you now need to go back and do your officer safety training, which is an completely improving picture in terms of the officer training, uh, officer safety training we're providing staff, then it might be that. But if it's actually that as they stop them, they've been aggressive too soon, they've been inappropriate in their use of language, inappropriate in their use of force, which can't be justified, then, of course, then we are moving into possible misconduct where it will then be investigated, either by local investigators, uh, central investigators from a complaints discipline perspective, or, of course, the IOPC. There is such a huge range, as you well imagine, um, because policing... In the context that you've described, we've had these conversations many, many times, and I, you know, obviously there are so many more facets to policing uh, on the BCU that we never, we, we very ever rarely touch upon, which, you know, obviously I would lo love to have a conversation about as well at some point. Um, but in this one particular element, stop and search, use of section 60, use of force, reducing violence, use of section, um, you know, the whole gambit, um, it's not an exact science. We absolutely know that. We go where the intelligence is. Officers have to use their professional curiosity as well as their professional judgment. We absolutely expect them to work in a very professional, restrained manner, proportionate, and they have to justify what they do. And if members of the public complain because it's not done properly, or we get obviously sight of things that aren't being done properly, then there is a whole range of activities that we can undertake to bring that person up in terms of the way they operate or if they're just completely not suitable for the organisation or for policing then that's the very end of the spectrum and um, the IOPC and serious misconduct you know will no doubt play out. Okay so I've been characterising that you talk about I'm sure your officers are professionals but what if we took them at trust and confidence how do you, as, as the Met Police, both yourself as the Borough Commander and Commander Connors, actually let the public know about how officers are dealt with, obviously not the individuals, but how do you 
you know, what's your communication strategy for building trust and confidence to let members of the public know that officers are disciplined or are trained if they are deemed to be acting not professionally? Because I yeah. think part of the problem is that people don't know. I mean, obviously, we've seen the big report that uh, Councillor uh, referred to earlier uh, where the police were... Uh, uh, called um, institutionally corrupt because uh, they were investigating themselves and kept covering up uh, what the fact they were um, investigating correctly. So people see that um, headlines by an independent commission. So how are you going to build trust and confidence with the community to know what you're doing? And then I'll bring Councillor Rosen in. So I think that's as I've already mentioned, um, there's a huge amount of work uh, going on, led by Andy Port, my head of neighbours, working with Morris uh, and the Community Safety Partnership more broadly, um, <laughs> in a wide range of community engagement. Um, that obviously includes our safe neighbourhood boards, our IAGs, our other monitoring groups. We've also invested and in improving the work we're doing around our communication. Uh, of course, we have the rest of the Metropolitan Police Service, um, which supports local policing, be it through MOPAC, be it through uh, community engagement inclusion teams, uh, the work of the uh, Deputy Assistant Commissioner Connors um, through the sort of the use of force piece. So there's a huge amount of work going on. Obviously, again, they're linked to the IOPC and other such things where we are constantly um, explaining and describing the work that we're doing and as I've already said at a local level significant work going on and uh, you know as colleagues from MOPAT uh, also alluded to I'm afraid you know the work that we're doing um, is not going to be um, a very kind of quick easy fix this is stuff that we're doing and um, I think give it you know several months handful of years um you know whatever that looks like we will start to see sustained long-term improvements we're seeing green shoots now is very positive and um but what you absolutely will get from me and my team is a consistent strong focus working with the community safety partnership uh, to improve what we're doing on the street to hackney and i think we are seeing that and i think you know credit where credit's due there is a huge amount of work goes on not just my officers, and I'm not just saying because I'm biased, um, I am the first to say we need to improve in certain areas. But I look at Hackney and I look at the work that goes on, and uh, I don't think in many ways the partnership has ever been as strong, and I don't think the activity has ever been as diverse and as broad and as in-depth and as um, with as much vigour as we're seeing at the moment. Okay, thank you. Cats, oh, sorry, I kept interrupting. Okay, that's okay, thank you. So I'm just going to go around the same things, actually. Um, speak up, we can't hear you. You're going to really have to speak up. Okay, thank you. Is it working? Just very conscious of time as well. Go on. Yes, it works now. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Marcus. Um, yeah, it's stop and search is part of the police work. I agree with that. And... Uh, my actually, I was going to ask the question earlier, so asking that: uh, Do you have the data that shows teenagers, early teenagers, how many of them being stopped and searched, and how many how many of them not arrested, not committed any crimes, and police let them to go? And before I go there, and then uh, as chair mentioned. If you let the public know that, uh, especially if you let the public know saying that, uh, yes, our police officers are going to definitely, it is compulsory, they are going to wear their body worn camera and then there will be definitely recording. Even sound is going to be recorded. Even any person before stop and search in the police uh, vehicle, they will be the, poli the, the, uh, the officer who's gonna stop and search, 
giving the reason, report, reporting it, and then giving the reason why they are stop, stopping and searching that person just before they do, they do take an action. If you record all of them there, we've got the technology to record all of those, all the sounds, even we can ins install the camera on the police cars, which shows the uh, stop and search site. It can be done. And then technology is there. All we need to is to do is the uh, our officers will will definitely use the cameras, definitely report the reason why they are st uh, they are doing stop and search for that person, and then get all information put in the one center and data center and share with your uh, partners. And then explaining this to the public, and then when you have a meeting with the communities, if you tell them if they have any concern about stop and search, uh, then it, things are going to be easy, very, very uh, clear and transparent, so they can see from the reference number of that stop and search, they can see all the uh, footages and also uh, communication, they can listen. So I think that would help. So yeah. they, would, they would help for everything. Then, then we wouldn't talk about this kind of things at the moment if we use the technology on this basis. Thank you. Yeah, councillor. Um, so just on that point, um, obviously I've, I've mentioned many, many times and um, in terms of and, and I think this is probably the, the point that we've, we've, we've alluded to numerously. Um, Body-worn video is um, an absolute, and we are now in a position across London, exactly the same in Hackney and my officers. In fact, you know, nobody goes out on the street without a body-worn video. You know, that, that is where we are. Everybody has access to body-worn video. Occasionally, technology doesn't work. A button hasn't been pressed or battery has failed, you know, we are in a technological world and it's not an absolute fail-safe. But we are at about 98%. 98% of all the stop and search encounters... I'm sorry, for, in, I'm sorry for interrupting. Did you say about the, the battery, the battery issues sometimes? Well, every now and again, you know, I'm, I'm just making the point that, you know, we are 2% short, roughly, across London of 100% compliance with body on video capturing every single stop and search and every encounter we have with Londoners. And, um, you know, we are at that very, very high level. Um, and that's why, you know, we are starting to see um, the, the areas where we can scrutinise and we can hold people to account. And we are seeing the improvements. And I think the public are aware of that. You know, the, the Mets have recently... Um, through various different mediums, explained about stop and search and the body-worn video usage and the supervision rates. Um, every month we take somewhere in the region of 400 weapons off of the streets of London. Um, so we are very clear about the use of stop and search. We're very clear about that. We are continuing to communicate it. I think there is some work to be done across the partnership. And if I may say, I think that absolutely includes the scrutiny commission to be part of that really positive work, to go out on the streets and to talk about, you know, the, the community uh, cohesion that's needed and the collective work to bring safety to the streets. And you asked about stopping young people. I don't have the data with me. What I can say, um, in the last six months or so, um, we stopped something like between 600 and 850 people a month in Hackney the whole of Hackney every month, um, and we are around about 27% average positive outcome rate. Yes, very sadly, and I absolutely wish that was never the case, that we do sometimes have to stop young people uh, as young as 12 years of age that have got zombie knives and drugs on them uh, that are out there committing serious acts of violence or involved in serious acts of violence, be it a victim or otherwise. You know, we have very young people on the street. And I make the point again, councillor, I, I uh, urge people to come out and see the officers work for themselves on the streets of streets of Hackney that, they, that, you know, that we police for you, to support you, to protect you. 
And I'm afraid it's all too often that young people, young teenagers, are out carrying huge knives, sometimes firearms, more often than not serious amounts of drugs, and they're involved in violence, and it has to stop. And that is why I will be absolutely clear about my officers continue to use stop and search in a proportionate legal way to keep people safe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, but uh, um, is that, I mean, what you are achieving, uh, what you've been told, telling us about what you achieved, uh, it, those are the positive things to hear about that. And how about, uh, how about, uh, do, do we, do we, have, how many misconduct issues you can tell us, which being quoted by body worn cameras or images, or, yeah. I'm sorry, what was the question? The misconduct issues by the police officers. Do we do we get them from the from the uh, body worn cameras, body worn images? Do we have any number of it? Well, number as I've said previously, as I've said previously, we have it uh, and we're going to do it again uh, in November because it's a year of we, we can't it's so labor intensive. Uh, in November, we're going to do another month of scrutinizing every single stop and search that happens on the BCU, as we've done previously. Um, and in between times, the work that we've done around improving through officer safety training, through local, uh, obviously, training, learning, development with the community, and as and when we hear of officers that aren't performing properly or there is a public complaint, we will deal with it. As a matter of course, at the moment, we do not publish data um, I don't. I don't think. Uh, I might be wrong. We don't publish data that says this is what has come out of it. Um, it's something that we could certainly go away and speak with MOPAC and the IOPC about. Um, but as I say, we have community monitoring groups and we have members of the community representing, you know, this commission, the community, the people of large, you know, of Hackney. You know, we have members of the public, and independents that come in and they hold us to account. Thank you. Thank you. I just, just the last question, perhaps. Or not? Okay. Um, well, one is an observation, which was really that uh, the Natasha from MOPAC was talking about how transparency and the use of data is going to be increasingly important. So, you know what? I would actually really like to see the Met pushing to actually publish some of this data to sort of take the initiative yourselves. And instead of waiting for different bodies to insist that you do it, for the Met to publish some of the data which, which it shows, where it shows bad behavior by officers and also what's being done with those officers. That is a really proactive way of gaining confidence, it seems to me, with, with the community to, to show that, um, you're taking their concerns seriously. So I just feel that you should think about that seriously before you kind of pushed into it. Um, and the other question I've got really is, 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 you know, I personally think it's great all of this use of the footage from the body worn cameras to root out bad behavior where there is bad behavior, um, whilst recognizing that they don't behave badly. Um, but I also know that, that the police sometimes have quite a negative attitude to members of the public who film the police while they're going about their, their business. And I just wonder what your attitude is to that, because that is, it seems to me, another possible safeguard um, when people film police officers doing their business in, in public. Um, and I wonder if you think it's a good thing or not. I, um, so just on the, um, the, the point of whether we should publish size, um, I will obviously have a conversation with colleagues and see whether that is being thought about or not. Um, so just on your point about um, do I think it's a good thing that the public film my officers and sometimes officers have a bad attitude? Um, well, as we've talked about, and I, and I don't want to sort of repeat you know, the conversation, but... Um, 
I'm afraid that sometimes officers, and if you were to come out and see what officers do, and again, I'll make the, you know, make the offer, um, so I think it's really important that when people sit here and have conversations about policing and they're scrutinising policing, I think it's going to be an invaluable experience to come and see policing, you know, on the streets of Hackney. But, you know, do officers have a bad attitude? Well, I guess that, you know, being really candid, sometimes officers that are human beings are under extreme provocation. Um, and, you know, sometimes they might react in a way that we would not expect or want them. And that's when we have to deal with it. By and very much large, they are incredibly restrained. I am incredibly proud of what my officers have to put up with by some people on the streets. And, um, you know, I don't see often very bad attitude. But where I do see bad attitude, and I had an incident a few weeks ago with members of the Jewish community, rest assured, those officers were immediately taken off of the streets and they have been dealt with and they have learned some lessons. So we don't stand for it and we don't put up with it. Do I put up with or do I accept or do I think it's okay for members of the public to film officers going about their business? No, it's a free country, absolutely, and members of the public absolutely can do that. Where I have, um, obviously, some concern is where I see my officers being put under extreme provocation, subjected to violence, and there are members of the public that would rather stand by and film my officers, your officers, being assaulted on the streets. They would rather film it and laugh than call 999 or do anything else that might be their civic duty, then I think that's not necessarily what I would expect of the community and the public to support their police. So I think there's a balance. You know, I don't have any issue at all, and my officers absolutely know that. They see it all the time, with people filming them going about doing their professional duty. And, um, you know, that that is what, you know, we, we have come to expect and that's absolutely fine, of course. But I do sometimes think it goes a bit far. And then if it is in that situation, and then those people that are filming, and you might recall about a year and a half ago, two of my officers savagely beaten on the street yes. trying to arrest somebody. And in amongst it, you know, there was a member of the public that came out to help them. But in amongst it, there were two people standing there jeering and filming while my officers, your officers, were being severely beaten. Now that is where I do have a, a, an issue with it and it's absolutely wrong. So I think there is filming and there is filming. Okay, thank you very much Commander Barnett. I think that's been very useful. Obviously uh, this commission doesn't uh, support very much about anybody being beaten up, police officers or members of the public. Um, and we know that, that many that all, that police officers do try and do their job uh, to the best of their abilities and are public servants. Um, we haven't decided our programmes actually for, next, for the for the rest of this uh, municipal year, but I would like to perhaps come back to this subject perhaps uh, before the end of uh, the municipal year, perhaps in March, and then we can... Uh, hear of the improvements and uh, that, you're, that you've talked about and Natasha's talked about some, uh, and the good community engagement work. I'm sure members of this commission would love to go out with uh, your officers and see what they do. I, I know I certainly would. I think I know you've made that um, offer in the past, but I think we've had COVID and people have been a bit reluctant perhaps to go out um, with strangers in a car um, in close proximity. But it's certainly, um, it's certainly something, as I said, you know, I, I know I'm a bit of a stuck record, but I don't make any apology for it. We have got people coming out on ride-alongs now. And as I said, you know, I would uh, absolutely encourage every member uh, of the Scrutiny Commission, the Scrutiny Group, uh, to come along and to see your officers working, you get a really good understanding. And um, I think it would just help so much, you know, because policing is so nuanced and it's so wide ranging and there are so many things to what they have to do. And yeah. um, I think it would just enrich the conversations we have in the future. Councillor Patrick, it's Maurice. I will, if you, if you email me, I'll liaise with your person. 
and okay. facilitate that. I'll facilitate that for you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And anybody Brilliant. else, okay. in, I'll do that for you, no problem. Um, right. well, thank, thank you very you. much, everybody. Thank you very thank you. much for a very interesting meeting, and we will come thank back you. to this. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. So I have a bit of business to do. Uh, we have to formally agree the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, can we agree then? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Um, on the work program, as I said, we haven't formally agreed the work program as such yet. We have the next meeting planned out, which is some work, courses and work we asked officers to bring forward from last last uh, the last municipal year. But the work we are looking at planning at the moment is um, around uh, the council's commitment to net zero um, carbon emissions. And our sales and uh, work deals in the economy also plan to look at it and scrutiny commission. And we're all going to be taking up different parts of the council's um, commitment. So we will be looking at things like buildings, uh, solar energy, how we build our buildings, how we retrofit our, our buildings what we can do to get the private sector to be uh, more greener uh, and those sorts of issues. Uh, obviously skills and I'm going to be looking at green jobs and uh, the security commission will look at the budget uh, regarding uh, our proposals. So that's something we've got, we, we're working up. We've had several meetings with both cabinet members um, who are responsible, so that's perhaps McKenzie and Hats of Coburn, who are very keen that we take up that work and have come up with some good ideas and officers. I've also been a joint scrutiny panel, a one off scrutiny panel with um, children's um, scrutiny uh, board to do a one off piece of work around looking at um, how we provide housing for our care leavers because we are their parents, uh, their corporate parents, and um, how we actually provide um, care and support for them and housing. And I've agreed um, to do a piece of work with um, children's scrutiny on that. I think it's very important that we um, fulfil our obligations as corporate parents. And many of these young people don't have family to fall back on. Um, no. And we, we need to make sure that um, they've got sustainable um, homes for the future. So that's one piece of work. And maybe uh, we can combine that with some look at some work at looking at the council's housing company, because what many that I've been found out many local authorities often to offices use their housing companies to provide housing, build housing or buy housing for uh, that they rent to to care leaders as a way of making sure that they've got sustainable housing. So that's some of the ideas we're working on. When we come to our meeting in July, we will have a full program um, to give to you and hope that you'll agree. So that are the issues that have been coming up, um, meeting our cabinet colleagues and officers, and uh, we think it's going to be a very exciting and um, green year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you everyone for coming tonight and thank you for keeping all most of the time um, and uh, for attending and making this meeting for us uh, in yeah. a COVID safe way. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. And thank you to everybody online for attending and yeah. taking part. Thanks very much, Chair. It's Thanks, been a pleasure.